The Detroit Pistons in their first game back from All-Star break fall to the Orlando Magic on the final defensive possession of the game. A tip-in by Wendell Carter Jr. sends the Pistons home with an L. I'm going to tell you guys in today's episode why that final defensive possession shows a bigger issue or confusion from the Pistons' entire season. Stay tuned for that on today's episode of Locked On Pistons Podcast. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button of the YouTube channel or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you are listening to this on. And today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online, available to people worldwide. And they have a special offer for my listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on. So the Detroit Pistons have played their first game. I'm recording this right after their first game back from All-Star break. They lost to the Orlando Magic 108 to 106. Now, I don't want to come off and look and sound like I'm too angry about this. Because you guys remember on the last podcast, I said the third priority, the third biggest priority of the season was to prioritize the tank, prioritize the lottery pick in the offseason. So a close loss, you think I'd be like, okay, that's exactly what we need at this point in the season. I'm not. I would have liked them win this game, and here's why. And maybe, maybe, you know what, maybe not even just win the game, but not lose like how they did. And the reason why they lost is something that has confused me from literally the opening point of the season. It's It's been so confusing to me. And what it is is that the Pistons – had this game at 106-106, and they had a final defensive possession. They had one defensive possession. They had to get a stop, and they were going to go to overtime with a chance to win. They may have lost anyways, but they had a chance to win in overtime. They could just force one stop, just one stop. And on this final possession, they went small ball with Isaiah Stewart at the five, Isaiah Livers at the four. They had Killian Hayes, Alec Burks, and um, and Boyan Bogdanovich. I, for the life of me, this I, I tweet this out as soon as it happened. This team confuses the living hell out of me. Because since the offseason, we have heard nonstop. We've heard nonstop about how this team envisions being a two-big man team in the future. How they want to play two bigs on the floor at all times this year. We, we Heck, the reason why they trade for Wiseman is because they believe they can play him in the two-big man lineup. Which, by the way, we didn't even get to see him and Duran play together. Now, I think I'm going to give Casey a break with that because I think some of it might have had to do with Jalen Duran dealing with foul trouble the entire night. Either way, for a team that has talked so much about playing two bigs, for a team that has talked so much about how important playing two bigs are, far too often we've seen them close games with small ball lineups, come out on foul defensive possessions, and play small ball lineups. There's, it's been and far too often throughout a game they play small ball lineups. It doesn't. It's so. It, it just confuses me. If you want to be a small ball team, if you want to play Stu at the five, then do it. But then don't tell us that you prioritize two big lineups and how important a two big lineup is. That's the first thing. It's just so confusing to me. And the reason why the Pistons lost is because Stu didn't box out Wendell Carter Jr. Isaiah Livers forced a tough left-hand layup from Paolo Bencaro, a good contest. I thought Paolo was going to make it, but nonetheless, a good contest from Livers made it tough on him. And then Stu didn't box out Wendell Carter Jr., and then also didn't go to the rim. He quite literally just stayed at the dotted line and watched the ball on the rim. Didn't fight to the rim. The final defensive possession of the game. Didn't go flying to the rim. Didn't fight towards the rim. Didn't fight for the rebound. Didn't box out. Quite literally just watched Wendell Carter Jr. walk around him and put the ball back in the basket. Whether you're playing small ball lineup or not, that's just unacceptable. Missing the box out is bad. Yeah, I can understand. Not really understand, but that's a mistake you can point out on film and be like, hey, you just got to be better boxing out. But not boxing out and then also just watching the ball and not fighting to the rim when you are the big guy on the floor, that's just unacceptable. That, that's that's purely unacceptable. And what makes this even worse, what makes this even worse, is that the Pistons had someone on their team with 10 rebounds this game in four less minutes than Isaiah Stewart, and that was James Wiseman. Now, look, I am not trying to sit here and say 
that James Wiseman is some defensive mastermind where he needs to be on defensive closing lineups. Not saying that. And even Jalen Duran, in just 22 minutes of action, with the five fouls he had, he had eight rebounds himself, the same amount as Isaiah Stewart, who had 27 minutes. What I am saying is, is that James Wiseman, I thought was playing fine defense this game. By the way, we're going to talk about this a little later in the podcast, but his defense, it has nowhere near been as bad as what people were making it out it was going to be. I actually think he's been fine defensively. It's I, it's, I don't know if he's just putting more work or something. I don't know, but he's been better on that end. Either way, my point is, is that when you have an emphasis on two bigs and the guy you're playing at the small ball five is not a great rebounder, and we all know is not great at center, you have two other bigs who are good rebounders. Actually, let me let me fall back a little bit. James Wiseman, I don't know if I'd call him a good rebounder right now, but in this game, he was rebounding the ball really well in the second half. First half, he struggled with it. In the second half, he was really active and played really well. Either way, there's no reason why you should not have had Stu at the four and then one of the centers at five, either Jalen Duran or James Wiseman. There's no reason why you don't go with size. There's no reason. Stu would have been perfectly fine guarding Paolo himself. Perfectly fine. And then you put Livers and Wagner, which is a good matchup for Livers. So you got two guys who would be really good guarding their wing guys, who are their best players, and Paolo and Franz, Stu and Livers on those guys. You got either Wiseman or Duran fighting with Wendell Carter Jr. You got Killian on Markel Fultz. And then you can just pick and choose who you want on Gary Harris. Do you want length out there? You can go with Boyan. You want some energy and a guy that may roam a little bit? Go with Diallo. I probably would go with Boyan just to play it safe. But literally, you could go anywhere else. But the fact that they don't have two bigs on the floor, when Orlando themselves, the entire game was giving the Pistons fits around the rim because of their length and their size, the fact in the final defensive possession, you then would go small against a big team in the front court, is just mind-boggling to me. It just it not only is that mind-boggling to me, but look, we can you you guys can criticize Dwayne Casey for not having Duran and Wiseman in. I think it's a fair criticism. But man, what Stu did in that final position is unacceptable. He has to wear a lot of the blame. Whether Dwayne Casey had him out there or not, whether he had him out there with a the big, another big or not, he has you on the floor. He expects you to try. He expects you to put effort as if it is the final defensive possession of the game. And look, I, I don't think many people have said this about Stu much at all throughout his career, but on this play, he was just out of it. I, 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 I Seriously, I'm flabbergasted. I never thought that I would see Stu. Now, missing a box out, again, that's just a common mistake, but not fighting to the rim, not making an effort for the board, not getting physical down there. He, I don't even know if he jumped off the ground. I, I don't think if Stu I, – I don't even know if Stu left the ground, I, quite literally. I, I'm pretty sure – Right now, I probably bet saying he didn't leave the ground. If he did, it was way too late after he left the ground. That's just – it's just unacceptable, dude. Can't can't have that at all. Can't have that, but again, for a team that has talked so much about two big man lineups, for a team that has talked so much about how, how important it is to be – you know, have two bigs on the floor moving forward, the fact that they continue to close all the time with small ball lineups, the fact that they come out in, 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 in defensive possessions – with small ball lineups, it's it's quite confusing to me. Quite confusing to me. And it would make a little bit more sense if you were going against a team that was also like smaller and you wanted to match them and be able to switch one through five, I guess. It would make sense. But Orlando's, again, Wendell, Paolo, Franz, all big time. All big time. Six, nine and above. Lengthy, athletic. They were causing the Pistons fits all night. On the glass, around the rim. It just it 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 confuses me, man. It I'm I'm confused. But it's something that I throughout the rest of the season, there's 22 games left. If we don't see more of an emphasis on playing two bigs at all times on the floor, I'm going to be frustrated because of how much Weavers talked about how important it is, and how quick Casey himself has even talked about how important it is. And you have Wiseman who they're trying to get minutes. With Duran, with uh, with uh, uh, Stu, so I, I don't I don't know, man. It's I'm sure you guys can hear the confusion in my voice. It's just like I I don't get it. I, I really I really just don't get it at all. But tough game. The Pistons turned the ball over 19 times. Quite honestly, they didn't deserve to win this game. They were very sloppy with the ball all game. Um, it is what it is. When we come back though, I want to talk about Jaden Ivy, who played a fantastic game here. And hit a big time three that probably should have been an and one to win the game versus the Magic. I want to talk about him a little bit when we get back. But first off, I got to tell you guys about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Today's episode is brought to you 
by better help. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed and like you're not showing in the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of yourself because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. And me personally, I haven't went through therapy, but I can say this. No one out here is strong enough to just go at life by themselves. Everyone at times needs some help. And why not go to better help and benefit for some therapy, some online therapy. And if you want to give therapy a try, there's no better option than better help. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. It's any, anybody who is struggling at any point, even for the smallest things in life. None of us go through this life perfect. Nobody goes through this life knowing the answers to everything. We all need help. So if you want to give therapy a try again, check out betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. Again, visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash locked on. So I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons, hit that subscribe button, or leave us a five star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. The Pistons lose this game, and honestly, and look, we talked about the final possession, and it was bad, but they really didn't deserve to win this game anyways. They shot nine, or they had 19 turnovers. And the only reason why they were in this game is because they made 17 threes. They shot 50% from deep, 45% from the floor. And a lot of that was Alec Burks, who only played 18 minutes. He hit all four of his shot attempts, all four of them being threes. He had 16 points in 18 minutes. That's like vintage Michael Beasley with the New York Knicks kind of stuff, point per minute kind of thing. But And then a third quarter assault by Hamadou Diallo just came out firing and lit a spark. That was why the Pistons were in this game. But to be honest, they played a very sloppy game. And they're lucky that it was only a two-point game. But another one of the reasons why this game was close and they had a chance to win nonetheless is Jaden Ivey. Jaden Ivey had 25 points, 9 of 13 from the field, 5 of 7 from deep. He did miss two free throws late, but he made up for it with an absolute big-time three with eight seconds left, pull-up three-pointer. Probably should have been a flagrant foul. The dude undercut him. I don't remember who it was that undercut him, but he came up off a pick and roll. They went under the screen despite the fact that they uh, were down or up by three. They gave Jaden Ivey the three to take. He took it, made it, and it should have been an and one. He played a really damn good game. And there's a few things within his game that really stuck out to me that I I just want to point out. And it really shows his development as – I I don't like saying point guard. I want to try to stop saying point guard. Because the NBA is so positionless, and he shares a backcourt with Killian Hayes. He's going to be sharing a backcourt with Kay Cunningham. I think the better word is just simply improving as a playmaker and improving as a decision maker and improving or maturing as a basketball player. I I love some of these things he did tonight. The first thing that really jumped out to me was that he was super efficient in this game, and he only had four assists, but I'm telling you, he probably should have had like eight or nine. He routinely was making the right play routinely was making the right pass, routinely was making the right read and pick and roll. And you guys remember at the beginning of the year, one of my biggest critiques about Jay and Ivy was that I said I thought he was having a lot of bad process, bad results, bad process, good results kind of things. He For the last month and a half, he's had a, a lot of good process, bad results. Good process, good results. Good process, great results. He's playing within himself. He's playing within the offense. He's playing much more mature. He's not just going out there looking for a shot, even though he's taking it when it's there and making it. He's not just going out there looking for a shot, flying to the rim, you know, out of sorts and whatever. He's playing very composed and finding open guys in the pick and roll. He only took 13 shots. Only took 13 shots, was trying to find his teammates, was trying to get them all involved. I love that from him. And another part, in this game that just shows his maturity and his development as a basketball player. And this is something the great point guards in this league have done. You'll see I, one of the, the quickest example I can, I can come up with is how Chris Paul 
handles uh, DeAndre Ayton. When DeAndre Ayton's having a tough night, Chris Paul continues to look for him, continues to give him confidence, continues to find him, continues to try to get him easy looks and encourage him to keep shooting that he has trust in him. And when you show that you have trust in your players, when you have trust in your teammates, I'm telling you, it does a lot for them. Jane Ivey, and again, not, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is not a lot of guards do that. Once you pass to a guy and he misses like two shots, you start to hesitate. Oh, God, I, he missed the pass two. I, I should probably just keep it here. Like, you'll see them start to hesitate. Jane Ivey did not do this. Killian Hayes was 0 of 3 on threes entering into like the five-minute mark or the four-minute mark, whatever, of the fourth quarter. All of them were open shots. All of them were kickouts from Jane Ivey. Actually, one was a pull-up jumper. I take that back. Two of the three were kickouts from Jane Ivey. They were fantastic reads. Going through the pick and roll, making a cross court skip pass to the corner. Fantastic pass, fantastic read. And then another one in the fourth quarter, he ran a staggered pick and roll with Jalen Duran and Boyan Bogdanovich going to his right. Marco Fultz was tagging down on Duran's roll, and Jane Ivey was wasting no time whipping it to Killian Hayes in the corner. Killian Hayes missed his third one. Coming back down, I believe the following possession, Jane Ivey, they run the exact same play. He comes down, runs the pick and roll, Duran. Dive into the basket, and and Marco Fultz tags again. He hits Killing Hayes with the exact same read. It's the right read to make. It's the first read you're supposed to make when you see that guy tag down. He could have said, he's already missed a few shots. I probably need to try for something myself. No, he showed maturity. He showed trust in his teammates, and he gave his teammates confidence. Killing Hayes made that next one. And it made. I believe that was the one that made it a two-point game. I don't want that's that's not even a that's not a compliment for Killian Hayes. That is a straight up that, that's a, a fantastic play from Jane Ivey. He's not going to count more than one assist in the box score. He's not going to count for more than one three in the box score. But that that play right there shows so much growth from your rookie, so much more mature maturity and playmaking, just IQ. This that's not first of all that's not a pass he would have made in the beginning of the season. He would not have made that pass in the beginning of the season at all. Not at any point throughout the game. He wasn't making that cross-court skip pass when it was there. He was struggling to figure out what to do in the in-between game. Then we saw him, okay, he's starting to figure out in the in-between game. We're starting to see him take middies. He made a few tonight. You're starting to see him operate a little bit with more comfortability in the in-between game. Then we started to see him make the cross-court or cross-court skip passes. And then tonight, you saw him, even though his teammate had missed the last two ones, he knew. This is the right play to make. This is the right basketball play to make. This is my read. I'm going to make it. I'm going to instill trust in my teammate. And it it rewarded the Pistons. And even if Killian Hayes would have missed it, even if Killian Hayes would have missed it, I would have came on here talking about the exact same thing. Because, again, not every player will continue to make that read, will continue to make that pass after a teammate has missed once, twice. They'll start forcing something themselves. That was – I. I know it's just one play, man, but it I'm telling you, it shows so much for Jay and Ivy, man. So much for him. And I I've loved what we've seen from him over the past month and a half or so. He's he's improved so quickly. So, so quickly. And I was probably was one of the amongst the Pistons community, I probably was one of the more critical ones about his start to the season, about some of his bad process stuff. And since then, I don't think it hasn't been just, oh, bad process continues to get good results. He's changed that process, and he's learned. He's matured as a player, and he's just he's just so much better now. He's so much better, and it's just a few months into his rookie season. We're not talking about year two, year three. He's made these progressions. He's made these progressions and developments within a few months of his rookie season. I, his ceiling is so high, it's insane. So high. The Pistons look like they made the right pick with Jay and Ivey. Jay and Ivey has, has look. He's been he's been fantastic for a rookie the past few months. Absolutely fantastic. And I'll simply I'll throw this out there. This might be a hot take. I'll throw this out there. Paolo Bencaro has not been playing well the past month and a half. Paolo Bencaro is down to 41% shooting from the field on the season. Paolo Bencaro shot 30% from the floor this game. Probably gonna go down. Jane Ivey's heating up over the past month and a half, two months. We got another 22 games of the season. Can Jane Ivey catch him? Could Jane Ivey catch him and win Rookie of the Year? Probably not because the national media has already rewarded Paolo Bencaro the best rookie since LeBron James simply because of his early start. 
You know how it worked last year. Kate had the first two bad games, and that was the narrative the rest of the way. Paolo Bancaro looked like Michael Jordan the first 10 games. Now he's going to be rookie of the year no matter what. And he po- Look, I'm not saying he shouldn't win rookie of the year. He probably will end up legitimately being the rookie of the year. But I don't think it's a close case. I think Jane Ivey can catch up to him, especially with how he's playing the last two months. So we'll see how that ends the rest of the rest of the season. But, yeah, man, Jane Ivey has been fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And this game he could have easily, easily had 25 points and eight, nine assists, easily, quite easily. Fantastic game from him. And he was a big reason why this was even a close game for the Pistons. You're seeing incredible improvement from the Pistons rookie. When we come back, I want to talk to you guys about, obviously, updating with the James Wiseman uh, play. It's been a big reason why a lot of people are tuning in. I want to talk about how he played in this game. It was definitely a, a, a tale of two halves, but in a good way, in my opinion. We'll talk about that when we come back. But first, I got to tell you guys about one of our sponsors, Nissan. Nissan's most electric player of the week is brought to you by the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. Now, there's only been one game. There's only been one game, obviously, since All-Star break. But I think the most electric player of the week, 100%, has to be Jay and Ivy. We just talked about his growth as a playmaker, and we already know how, how absolutely electric he is as an athlete. He's been brilliant. He's been fierce. He's been elegant with the way he gets to the rim. He's just so so much improvement throughout the season. And then in this one game of the week, in this one game of the week, not only did he hit an absolute big-time shot to close this or to really make this a close game at all, but again, like we just talked about, over and over making the right read, developing as a player. He's just an extremely powerful driver to the rim. He's just been fantastic for the Pistons. So he is my Nissan's most electric player of the week. Brought to you by all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. The 2023 Nissan Aria pins you to your seat, power, and premium intelligence all-in-one EV. The all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. The EV for people who love to drive. Stop now at NissanUSA.com. So I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, Head to the YouTube channel at Lockdown Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. So James Wiseman plays his second game with the Detroit Pistons. And I got to be honest with you guys. In the first half, it was absolutely ugly. In the first half of this game, James Wiseman looked, I don't think there's any other way to say it, but awful. He, he looked awful in that first half. He wasn't securing defensive rebounds. He missed a few bunnies. The, not being able to secure defensive rebounds really was what was making it such a bad half. He couldn't secure defensive rebounds against Cole Anthony in that first half against Jalen Suggs. It, it was tough. It was a tough half by him. He also had a travel in the second quarter of switching his pivot feet, which, by the way, let me just say real quick, since we talked about that travel, the refs tonight were awful. The refs, the refs were absolutely awful. I can't get fined for that unless Locked On listens to this and they have some code that I didn't know. But the refs were awful. The, the, the Magic were absolutely beating the hell out of the Pistons' backcourt in this press. They ha- The Pistons had two eight-second violations. Marco Fultz and Jalen Suggs were just allowed to beat the hell out of Jane Ivey and Killian Hayes. They they literally beat the hell out of Boyan Bogdanovich in one play at the end of the game, knocked him to the ground, he threw it up, then they beat the hell out of Jane Ivey, he threw it up to somebody, and then they beat the hell out of that person, and there were finally a foul called. It was just, they, they were allowing the Magic to play some of the most physical basketball I've seen in 2023. It was, it was, it was, it was BS, to be honest with you. I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to call it what it is. It was BS. I'm cool with being physical. I'm cool with allowing them to play physical basketball. But what they were allowing that backcourt to do, pressing wise, getting up in guys, they, they weren't just getting it up in guys. They were full forearm into guys. They were just, they were beating the hell out of the Pistons players. And it was going the other way too. Wendell Carter Jr. probably just got he he got his ass whooped down down low. He he was getting beat and he wasn't getting no foul calls either. So the refs, despite the fact that they were like they were calling a bunch of ticky tack foul calls like on moving screens, but then would allow guys to just like clothesline each other down low. It was just like I I don't know what the hell was going on in this game. I I it, it, the refs did not have a great game in this game. But anyways, back to James Wiseman. Now, he did not play a good first half. But then in the second half, he came out and played so much better. 
He ended the game with 10 rebounds. He got much more active on the defensive glass, was much more physical on the defensive glass, assertive on the defensive glass, securing a bunch of defensive stops for the Pistons. He got a few bunnies to go on the offensive end of the floor. And look, this is my biggest takeaway from James Wiseman through two games. The defensive concerns were not are not as bad as people made him out to be beforehand. He's not a perfect defender. He's not a great defender. But he's not Enos Cantor. He's not like – like uh, people were making it out to be that like he's just this terrible defensive player like Marvin Bagley. That's – it's not – no, it's not the truth. He had multiple good defensive reps again in drop coverage. He actually is a pretty decent rim protector. He knows how to use his length and athleticism around the rim to deter shots. You, he did it a few times tonight. He uses his length really well on the perimeter to contest shots. And he usually stays on the ground. He had one uh, play tonight when he jumped and was drawn into a foul. But outside of that, he usually stays on the ground and doesn't bite on pump face this far. And he's been much more mobile on the perimeter guarding guys on switches and stuff than I thought he would be. Hey, he hasn't been as bad defensively. I'm not going to come out and say he's a good defender, that he's been one. But, like, he's been... I don't see this this terrible defensive player that people have been talking about beforehand that we were going to see. I don't see that. Uh, at least not yet. Maybe it pops up in the future. Maybe he's just putting more effort into it because he knows it's his first impression with this new team and maybe he'll slack off or something. I, I don't know. But so far, he's been better defensively than anyone's given him credit for beforehand. I, I don't know what he was doing over in Warriors Nation. I don't know how they were using him over there in Golden State. But he hasn't been bad defensively, in my opinion. I, I've seen quite a few good defensive reps from him. So I, that actually encourages me a lot. It encourages me a lot. The one thing I'll say about him offensively is that this team clearly doesn't know how to use him offensively yet. They, they have no clue how to use him offensively. The biggest issue you saw from James Wiseman minutes on offense, specifically in the first half and even some in the second half, is that they're just using him as if he's – you know, just like any other big, they're, like they're, he's Isaiah Stewart. They're just planning him, having him set picks and then roll to the rim. Set pick, roll to the rim. They're not really giving him the ball. His team's not looking for him when he gets the switch down low. As soon as he gets a switch onto a guard, he's fronting instantly. And he got them in the paint, way underneath the rim. They got to throw him the ball instantly. They don't do it. They 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 passed him up multiple times in the first two games in, of his Pistons career. And then on the few times he does get the ball, is that now he's looking to score. You, you saw in the first half, he was just straight up looking to score because he hadn't gotten the ball the other times. And now he feels like, okay, I got the ball now. I need to prove my worth. I need to prove what I can do. And then he just goes out there and he was forcing stuff out in the first half. Second half was much better. But even still, I, he could have had, like, I kid you not, Hamadou Diallo, if he would have looked for him on a few dump-offs in that first half and even one drive in, in the transition um, in the second half, James Wiseman could have had like six to eight more points there. There was a few times Alec Burks missed him on a lob. Corey Joseph missed him on a lob. There was a few times where the Magic strap just switched Jalen Suggs onto him, and he was front underneath the paint, and they just wouldn't give him the ball. It's to, they have to learn that they're playing with a guy who is incredibly talented offensively, incredibly physical, a physical specimen, and is able to demolish switches. And they have to, they have to look for him. They just have to look for him. But outside of that terrible first half, but then came out in the second half, played really well. That says great things about him is that he was able to put that first half behind him, able to come out and use that as motivation to come out in the second half and play much better. I thought he played really damn well in the second half. And to be honest with you guys, I, look, I saved this for the end of the podcast. For those of you guys who stayed and listened, I know it drops off a little bit towards the end. I probably would have closed with James Wiseman on that final possession. Not going to lie to you guys. D- D- Duran looks like he's... His bounce didn't look the same. I think he's hurt. I, I do. I think he's hurt right now. He was struggling to move around, I feel like. He was in foul trouble. He was able, wasn't able to get into the game because of foul trouble. But also, I just didn't feel like he was moving around great. I don't feel like he was getting the, the same type of burst jump that he usually does. And we know he sprained both angles right before the All-Star break. And he looked beat up in other spots, too. So, I don't know if he's 100% healthy. So, in that final defensive possession, I probably would have closed with, on that final possession, Wiseman, Stu. Livers, Killian, and then I probably would have trusted Boyan in the final possession to use his length and his veteran leadership to understand switches. But I probably would have considered also putting Diallo into the game. That That's a toss-up right there. But I, I would have probably went with Wiseman, Stu, in that final defensive possession. I liked what I saw from Wiseman defensively in that game. I would have closed with him. They needed that size, and I think him and Stu would have – I think Wiseman would have fought for the rebound. I don't know if he would have secured it, but I don't know if that tip-in happens. He would have at least – got his hand on the ball or fought around the rim based on what we saw in that second half. So that's what I would have done. But 
yeah, definitely a tale of two halves in this sec- in this second game for James Wiseman, but I- I'm happy with how he came out in the second half and played. I-, I want to see the Pistons use him in a more creative way, man. Use him with some DHOs. Run some inverted pick and rolls with him. Run, run some run some crazy stuff with him, man. He's incredibly talented. He's not just some guy you're going to pick, dive to the rim, happen to get offensive rebounds. Like, that's not how they should be using him. He's, in, he's talented, dude. Give him the ball and let him try to do some stuff. So I hope we see that in the next game. That's all I've got for you guys today, though. Thank you guys for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. Hit that subscribe button at the YouTube channel, Lockdown Pistons, obviously. Leave us a five-star review or whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. And until next time, go Pistons. Stay safe. The ice storm has knocked out a ton of power all over where I live. If you guys are living in Michigan in this ice storm, stay safe out there. But until next time, I'll see you guys later. Peace out.